Awards, as well, as well as a member and donor letter and on social media for the public at large. Please look out for it. And if you enjoy conversations about literary criticism and contemporary literature and books, please consider bidding or giving generously at the auction so we can keep um, the momentum going around, the con around this conversation. Tonight, we'll be talking about racial realities that are unfamiliar to us as critics and readers. We'll be examining how literary critics might develop an awareness of other people's racial realities and deepen their understanding of a particular author's racially informed artistic tradition. Among other things, we'll be considering when critics should seek editorial guidance to identify potential racial blind spots as they read books. I'm honored to present our conversationalists, Lisa Teasley, Miriam Gerba, David Mora, and Eric Lieberman. They've each placed race at the forefront of their critical, editorial, and artistic practices in ways that astound me, and they each have knowledgeable and educated opinions about race that both critics and readers at large should hear. Lisa Teasley is the author of the novels Dive and Heat Signature, and the award-winning story collection, Glow in the Dark, which is published by Bloomsbury. Lisa is the writer and presenter of the BBC television documentary, High School Prom. Her essays, stories, and poems have been frequently anthologized, appearing in publications and media such as NPR, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, Joyland, 7x7 LA, and Zizaba now editor at large for the Los Angeles Review of Books. She was the fiction editor there for five years. Lisa is also a visual artist who has exhibited widely. Miriam Gerba is the author of the true crime memoir, Mean, a New York Times editor's choice. Oh, the Oprah Magazine ranked Mean as one of the best LGBTQ books of all time. Publishers Weekly describes Gerba as having a voice like no other. Miriam's writing has appeared in the Paris Review, The Believer, Harper's Bazaar, and Time. She lives in Long Beach, California. David Mora's most recent book is A Stranger's Journey, Race, Identity, and Narrative Craft in Writing, which was a finalist for the 2019 Minnesota Book Award. He's written two memoirs, Turning Japanese, Memoirs of a Sensei, which won the Oakland Penn Josephine Miles Book Award, and was a New York Times notable book, and Where the Body Meets Memory. Eric Weiberman is a San Francisco social justice journalist, literary critic, memoirist, and poet. He has written for The Atlantic, The New York Times, Washington Post, Color Lines, Guardian, Los Angeles Review of Books, Black Scholar, and many other literary journals, including World Literature Today, where he is a contributing editor. He recently completed Jufro American, an interracial memoir. Eric and I each separately believed it was important to conduct conversations on race and literary criticism, but a huge thank you to him for coordinating our conversationalists and facilitating the talk tonight. It's my hope that this conversation serves as a kickoff for a series of National Book Critics Circle conversations on the intersection uh, between interpreting books and our particular moment in history, I think race is really at the forefront of important issues that face America today. And with that, I will <laughs> let Eric take it away. Thanks, Anita, for that introduction, for hosting, and thanks to NBCC for offering this forum for us to talk about a really important topic. Um, I know it's gonna be a rich conversation because we've got some really amazing writers here. Um, I don't want to say a lot at the beginning, really just kind of offer an opening question and then um, we'll go for a while and then maybe a half hour into it, we'll start taking some questions from the audience. Um, so the broad question that will allow everybody to go in the direction they want to is just this. What does racially conscious book criticism look like? And we could approach this also in reverse. What does it not look like? Um, we can look at it from the perspective of a reviewer, uh, an editor who's assigning reviews, a uh, fiction writer who's on the receiving end of reviews. And I also want to say that we'll probably get into looking at it on the institutional level, um, 
how publications function, the larger uh, culture of book criticism in America. And I should point out regarding that, that uh, in the larger picture of things, we have um, book critics and authors um, who disproportionately are white. And so, you know, that's an important thing to recognize as we look at the big picture of the conversation. So with that, if someone wants to uh, jump in to start, go for it. Should I repeat the question? Because I said some things <laughs> after. <laughs> I said I wasn't going to say anything and then I went on. So the question is, what does racially conscious book criticism look like? Well, I would say when I first started at LARB um, five years ago, when a book would come in, I would think at first in terms of culture um, is what's, what is the book, what is the culture that is discussed in the book and, and who are the writers that I know that could handle this particular culture. But I didn't necessarily say it has to be the exact same culture for you know here's an example though of what i've done more lately which is i come to trust a writer and know their the the you know like the vast openness of their mind and their heart their ability to get other cultures other races and you know for example you know i've worked with anita over a dozen times and she has reviewed, you know, um, a Norwegian woman, a black man, a, you know, like I could go on, you know, a dozen, a, a dozen different cultures, you know? So, I mean, working with a superb, brilliant writer who understands, you know, the human, that's what I look for first. But then um, we the survivors, because I'd spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia, I thought it would be great to have a Malaysian writer, you know, talk about this specific book. Um, and I asked Jamie Go to do it. And she said at first, well, I'm a sci-fi writer. And I said, but I, I think that someone that I, I love her writing. And I thought that someone who is Malaysian should talk about what it, what this book means. And then, but then when it came to just do a roundup of all of his books, a Chinese, Amer I asked a Chinese American, Richard Cho, because I'd worked with him many times and he, he didn't need to, to have lived in Malaysia to handle, you know, Tasha's work. So, um, so I would say that I'm racially conscious um, as an editor 50% of the time, maybe. And, and as a reviewer in the past, um, I've been asked to review all kinds of books and I felt like I could handle all kinds of books. Um, so, so that's it for now, because I feel like I'm going on. <laughs> you know, I'm just gonna jump in and say, thank you, Lisa. <laughs> I really appreciate all those kind of words. I think that's, that's really, nice to hear because I have to say, you know, I actually have felt some anxiety around reviewing people of um, authors of other races, not because I think I can't understand the work in a broader, broader sense, but more because as a fiction writer there, I know that there are cultural things I reference like cast that, you know, the broader public might not, might not have access to. And I assume that there's also similar features in multiple other cultures and multiple other racial consciousnesses um, that I may not even know is a, you know, is a, is a blind spot for myself. And so, you know, I, I wonder like, is that something that you've come across or like in your own reviewing, do you feel, do you feel like, oh, you know, I, I have something that I'm interested in in my own artistic practice that maybe a reviewer is not necessarily getting. <laughs> you mean me or so well, you, or if else. you notice someone else is doing it like with, okay, for example, I wrote that review on Ishmael Reed's um, conjugating Hindi, <laughs> but I was a little worried, right? Because there, you know, I don't know whether, um, I don't know whether I'm seeing every facet 
that he is putting into it as an artist, because, you know, as, as novelists and, and fiction writers and memoirists and poets, we put so much into the work and our own consciousnesses have differences from other people. And sometimes that's even the reason we write. And so, right. you know, I don't know if, if everybody wants, has an, an opinion on that. I would also be interested in hearing, you know, I'm, I'm just curious what, um, especially because you all also write creatively, right? So like, you know, that there are certain things a reader may not get about your work. Um, well, I, I think there's oh. several levels to this. One is just sort of literary intellectual. Like my first book of poetry, somebody attributed the long lines to, in a review to Ellen Ginsberg. They were actually influenced by Aimé Cesar and his notes of a return to the native land. Now the poem was actually an anti-colonial rant. So if you knew about the Francophone movement in French colonial literature, you would have recognized that. Similarly, like there are footnotes in Juno Diaz's um, Brief Wonders History of Oscar Wilde. And if you read the reviews, they attribute the footnotes to David Foster Wallace. But Diaz says they're from Patrick Schwamazo's Tejaco, which is a set in Martinique just before and after uh, slavery is abolished. Now, it, it just would make more sense to think that he's influenced by Schwamazo and Tejaco rather than David Foster Wallace. That's just people don't read enough. They don't read widely enough. Then you, so, so mm -hmm. another way of looking at it is what happens all the time in writing workshops where the writer of color, there's like one or two writers of color and then some of the white writers bring in stuff with stereotypes. Right, if they're bringing stuff in stereotypes, how are they gonna review a, a, a work by a writer of color? And they end up making ignorant remarks about the writer of color, which is why so many writers come to places like Kave Khanum and Kundiman and Vona, because that's a place where you can get critiqued by people who actually understand the traditions and the communities which you work out of. But beyond that, there, there is people, for all of us in terms of race and ethnicity, there are things we know we don't know and things we don't know we don't know. And one of the things we, you, that, that happens is, and, and Paisley Rechtel talks about this very, very cogently in her book, Appropriation, is the issue of double consciousness. And so, you know, this comes out of Du Bois and, and it can come out of the master slave dialectic. But it's this idea that if, if you're a person of color, you have to understand how white people think. You have to understand the norms. If you, if you enter middle class life in America, you have to know white middle class norms. And we can all read Hemingway because we've all been taught once you reach a certain level of education, you have to understand how heterosexual white males think. Just like you have to do it in any sort of institution. But that doesn't happen for the majority of white people. Right. They don't have to think about how we look at them. And the impulse from stereotypes, it, it, you can make one aware of stereotypes, right? And, and you, you can learn about stereotypes. But what is harder is the impulse behind stereotypes which is to say that the racial other is simpler, more easily understandable, more categorizable and flatter as a person than we actually are. And so unless you as a white writer or critic begin to deconstruct your white identity, no amount of cultural literary training will get you over the fine, you know, over that hump, you know? And, and, and then finally, there, there's a level of experience that anybody has. Like I would trust my friend, Alex Pate, to review my book, partly because we've been friends for decades, but also because he has many Asian American friends and that, that he has read in Asian American literature. So he's, He's dealing not just with literary knowledge, but also 
experiential knowledge, right? And he's, he's also talked to Asian Americans, so he understands the way we think about the world. So I, I would trust him to do that, but then he's not, he doesn't have the impulse to simplify me. He doesn't, he, he, he's aware that, that he is simplified by the culture, he is stereotyped by the culture, so he is conscious of, when looking at me, understanding that he has to begin to do the same thing for himself in looking at me and vice versa. So I think there's a deep psychological, political thing underneath this that is much harder to dismantle than people actually realize. I was gonna, um, I wanted to speak to what David mentioned about whiteness and the whiteness of critics. And um, when I was thinking about the notion of racial consciousness in literary criticism, I'm, something that struck me is that every critic has some measure of racial consciousness. Um, it's a matter of depth and it's a matter of breadth. That's what makes our, our racial consciousness differ. So if you do have like a cis straight white male critic who comes to a text, he's likely to have some awareness of that positionality. The problem largely is that there's not an acknowledgement of that lens when he might sit down to engage in a review or to engage in a critique. And that's often what I find very disingenuous about critique that comes from uh, hegemony is that there's not an acknowledgement that the critique is coming from hegemony. Um, but the hegemon has some measure of um, racial consciousness as well. And then I was also thinking about um, what Lisa was saying in terms of um, her experiences as both um, an editor and a critic. Uh, I remember like um, when I first engaged in some criticism was a long time ago when I was an editorial assistant at Girlfriends Magazine in San Francisco. Um, and I, uh, I was um, invited by my editor during my time there to review two books. And both of those books had to do with Latina lesbians. Those were the only books I was invited to comment on. And while I am like a, a Latina queer, I'm also uh, many people I'm, I, I, I do contain multitudes. <laughs> and so, and so I'm, I remember thinking like the very, the, the first time I was offered a Latina lesbian text, I thought to myself, okay, uh, I'll do this. But then the second time I was offered a Latina lesbian text, <laughs> uh, I was a little bit bothered by it. And then that became the, the critical pattern in my life that um, people would just sort of toss these Latina lesbian texts at me about once a year because they're not published that often. <laughs> so, um, so that sort of pigeonholing is troublesome. Miriam, I, I really appreciate a number of things that you said, but I wanna pick up on what you noted about um, the consciousness of the white critic, um, which is what I am, white male critic, um, hetero white male critic. Um, Whenever I review a book, I'm going into another person's world, the author's world, okay? And uh, it may be another racial world. When I do that, it's a dual process for me. On the one hand, it's like I'm going to graduate school. I mean, I'm immersing myself in the work that that author has done and the geography, the culture, um, the literary tradition, if there's a racial literary tradition, all of that, which I love to do. Um, that's largely intellectual work for me. The other part of it is I'm going inward. And here's where I'm picking up on what you said about um, uh, not sort of, I'm uh, not sure what word to use, but like not naming the one's consciousness to themselves, to themselves. I try to go inward and ask myself because I'm living in a culture that trains me not to look at myself racially. And that is what I need to do with every book. Because if it's an American author, 
that this is a racial conversation that's happening on the page on some level. So I have to ask myself, what, what does this book mean to me? How does this book speak to me? What do I, what am I missing? Where are my blind spots? You know, I think there's a certain humility, really there's a humility that comes with reviewing any book for me, but when it comes to race, if it's way outside my experience, I want to be, I want to do a lot of work and I also want to look at myself, um, which is an amazing learning experience. And I, and I also think it makes me a better critic. Um, and it's a, ongoing learning process that, um, you know, I'm never going to get there, right? I don't think any of us are going to get there. But, um, you know, this conversation is really helping me uh, to begin, you know, to think about that more, more deeply. Shall I throw out another question? I just want to add one more thing. Oh, about please this. add, yes. Is, what do I call it? Eros desire. We understand in this culture that certain faces, certain bodies are deemed attractive. Similarly, certain stories are deemed interesting, certain stories not. And I think critics have to be aware of a bias towards certain types of stories, some of which is fueled by stereotypes. If you look at almost every novel or work by a, a, a white artist about the internment camps. It features a white male and a Japanese American female. And when when the the the, the film director Ellen uh, Parker did this, you know he got some you know he asked um, Philip Katanda to write for it, and Philip said, "I'm not going to write for it because of this." And, and Parker kept on saying, "Well, this is just the story I'm interested in." And he's really not asking himself, why does this story interest me more than a Japanese American man and a Japanese American woman, or a Japanese American woman and a Japanese American woman, or a Japanese American man and a Japanese American man? Why is it that the story about a white male with a Japanese American? And of course, he was not aware of any of the history of colonialism or conscious of that. But even when people are aware of that, they may not be aware of their affective reaction to things. Like, yeah, it's all right, it's sort of good. And then you have people of color read your work and you go, it's, it's like vital to them, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, what is the difference? It's the same work. Why is there two, two different responses to it? I was, I was also uh, thinking that like the racialized critic is distrusted. And often what we have to say is suspect in ways that what a white critic says goes, uh, uh, goes trusted. And, um, and we're, like, we're often ascribed a certain level of incompetence because of our racialized status. And, and I'm thinking of, for example, like um, <laughs> when I critiqued American Dirt, <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, one of my critiques of it as a thriller was that yes, it works as a thriller, but it does not work as a didactic immigration novel. And, um, and I said that as a result of um, uh, personal experience and lived experience, right? And uh, a lot of white readers um, reacted to that assessment with hostility. And some of them have written to me to tell me that I was incorrect in my assessment of that novel and uh, its didactic nature because they read it and they now understand immigration exquisitely. But what I had communicated to them was that they were ignorant and they were going to be steeped in silliness. But because they don't understand that what they're eating is silly, they've gobbled what they believe is this nutritious meal when what they've consumed is a joke. You know what I mean? Because they don't have the competence to, to assess this thriller on, on, on uh, they don't have the competence to assess its merits as, uh, as a novel of social realism. And they're not going to trust a critic of, uh, uh, well, a racialized critic who tells that to them. They might trust a white critic, but they're not going to trust me. 
for whatever reason. And it's typically a question of competence and my incompetence and my perceived incompetence. And that's the racial epistemology of white supremacy. Our knowledge is always subjective, right? And mm -hmm. it is white knowledge, which is objective. Our knowledge is not true until it is sanctified by white knowledge, which is why people have kind of been saying for years about stuff about the police, white people didn't believe it until there's a video. What does that mean? We don't believe your word. Your language is not enough. And your language can't be the truth unless we deem it the truth. And they don't see that this is a basis of white supremacy. Another angle on that maybe, you may not agree with me here, which is why we're here, it's fine. <laughs> that I feel sometimes that critiques like the one that you did, Miriam, which was, which was very powerful of American Dirt, um, uh, that, that critics of color are burdened to be making those critiques, to take down a book, Right. or to challenge a book that's reflective of their own racial experience. Yeah. And I think that white critics need to do the work to be able to confront uh, books that are written by uh, people of other races where they're, where they're examining those issues, the stereotypes or, or whatever it is. That's a certain kind of competence. That's a kind of consciousness. Because I feel like white critics don't feel the responsibility. So I can't speak for white critics. I'll say it myself. I want to feel like I have as much responsibility to challenge something that is not well portrayed in fiction and not look to, uh, you know, oh, it has to be a Chicana uh, uh, um, critic to deal with a book about Mexican American experience. Um, as a critic, I want to be able to, and I feel a responsibility to look at any kind of text that is an American text. Okay, I have right. a question. Oh, you have another question. Right. I have a question, but I don't need to ask it. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so my question is about, uh, we're talking about books uh, so far where race is front and center. I wanna ask about uh, being conscious as critics responding to books where it would not appear to be front and center. So I, I wanna give an example. Um, I looked at the New York Times bestseller list of nonfiction this week. And I tried to look in terms of uh, the topic tonight. And I said, most of these books, really, if you look at them through that lens, they are about race on some level. So example I wanna give is Matthew McConaughey's memoir, Green Lights, which is like, number six on the bestseller list. Um, now, I doubt he would say that's a book about race. I don't think the people buying it are thinking about it in terms of race. Race is only mentioned twice in that book. Once he uh, talks about being the only white guy in a, uh, working in an all black blues bar. And the other is the very end, he talks about the protests of the summer of 2020 and Black Lives Matter. Uh, as an aside, it felt like he, just kind of added that in there. But whether it's genuine or not, that book is all about race in my view, because it's about a white guy who grew up in small town, Texas, made it big in Hollywood and has created this whole persona around it. But I doubt that anybody who reviewed that book looked at it through a racial lens. I don't know, I didn't, I didn't read many reviews of it. But that, so the question I'm asking is, how can critics begin to surface issues around race where maybe the author's not even intending it, but it's clearly there, especially white writers who are not thinking that they're writing about race when in fact they are, unconsciously perhaps. Does that make sense? But I went off on a tangent while you, because I was thinking about, I haven't I read his book, I've only seen snippets of interviews and and it seems as if it's been looked at as a spiritual uh, manual a bit more as a, as opposed to race or anything just more of he made it because he has these spiritual principles you know and then so I don't think that people would think about race or even it, it even about Hollywood as much. I mean, unless it's just what I'm watching, I don't know. 
I guess what I'm wondering is, I'm not arguing for, I'm just sort of wondering, <laughs> um, is it legitimate if you're a reviewer and you're looking at that book and you're focusing on the spirituality, you're, you're, you're you know, coming at it from where the author is coming at it, is it legitimate to also speak about the fact that this is a white man writing this memoir to, to on some level bring that theme into it. If I wrote about that book, which I wish I would have, <laughs> I don't know what I would have done, but I'm just, I'm kind of asking the panel, like, does that work? Is that something that seems worth doing? I, I, was, I was gonna say that, um, I mean, I don't know anything about this memoir. Uh, <laughs> But because Lisa mentions that um, that it's being treated as a memoir that's adjacent to spirituality um, in some ways, uh, <laughs> and, and I'm assuming that perhaps he credits some of his success to a spiritual source, perhaps, like that's what's happening in, in, in the text. I'm reminded of like a conversation that I had um, a couple months ago with a friend of mine who is uh, uh, a non-binary person of color, and they were they were in a relationship with um, a, a, a white sober person, and um, they had gone to a twelve-step meeting with a white sober person. And they were noticing that like white sober people were telling stories of having uh, been saved by their higher power over and over again when they had gone on these binges and encountered like this incredible danger. And the running joke amongst the people of color in the room was that wasn't your higher power, that was white supremacy that saved your ass. Do you know what I mean? And right, so, right, right. <laughs> and so <laughs> I didn't get it, that, that might be the kind of analysis that could be brought. <laughs> <laughs> to a work like McConaughey's. Um, <laughs> I actually do this in, in, in my book, A Stranger's Journey, about Jonathan Franzen. Yes. Because Franzen in an interview says he's never written about race. And he says, like, I would if I'd been in love with a black woman or I'd had black friends. And then he goes on to say, like I wrote about Germans and purity because I had a bunch of German friends. And he never asked himself like, why is it that I have, I was able to have a bunch of German friends and I don't have any black friends, first of all. And then he writes his book about, you know, this, this family lives in St. Paul. And what's never indicated in the book is how the demographics of that neighborhood, like a mile away, became more and more multiracial and, and immigrants flooding into that area during the period of the book. So he just slices off all the people of color. But beyond that, he has an Indian American in the book. A, a young Indian American falls in love, supposedly with, with the middle-aged white male. And he has this line where she, he's making love to her, where he says he, she needed him to do the downward dog. And, and <laughs> you, know, you come upon that and you go, what the hell, right? I don't think any reviewers picked up on it. But beyond that, he said she spoke with a lilt of an accent. But I don't think he ever considered, like, what age did she come? Like you can speak with an accent, you can come at five, you can come at eight, you, America 12, 16. It's a very different experience. Beyond that, the whole issue of what, what her family thinks about this or her ties to the family are completely absent from the novel. The white male terms her former Indian fiance, Indian fiance as ugly. And there's never a question of like, who's doing the judgment of whether the fiance is ugly. There's all these racial questions that are there in the book, but he, do, he doesn't even think he's writing about race. And beyond that, what I, what I would also say is when white writers go, uh, you, you know, Bridget and James, we're to assume that they're white. I or 
Anita or, or Miriam or Lisa, if we're going to indicate somebody from our community, we have to indicate race and ethnicity. So when the white person assumes, they're, they're assuming that whiteness is the universal default. All the rest of us are exceptions. It's also assuming that their being white is not important to their identity is not important right. to their racial, to their lived experience. Now you can believe right. that, but that's a political position. And it's a political position, which is actually closer to a conservative opinion position than a, a, a supposedly progressive opinion. So every time a white writer does that, they're actually reinforcing a, a white identity which posits white identity is both universal and invisible. And they don't really understand that they're doing that. And they have not begun to examine the whiteness of their characters, which is something that if they're, you know, and if you grow up in a white environment, that's very easy to do. If you grow up in a, if you're white working class and you perhaps grow up in an area where a number of different races are, you, you, you are suddenly conscious of your white identity in a very different way. And there needs to be a much more systemic examination by white authors and critics of what it means to be white in this country. Hopefully we can build on that. I promised that we would take some audience questions. So it's close to 540. So I wanna do that. I need to flag the question here for possible uh, sharing. It says, so we'll choose this one. Eric spoke about American texts. The question I have is what is an American text? And, and the person adds, from my perspective, we as critics and readers need to problematize that word. Kind of a philosophical question. Anybody wanna take that on? You know, I'll just note <laughs> that I actually just received this morning an email criticizing my review of uh, Rajiv Mohabir's Antaman because um, I was analyzing his work. Not necessarily, you know, I had some superior knowledge of his background, but not completely. He's an Indo-Guyanese um, queer poet, Amer American, um, critiquing white supremacy caste and, uh, yes. Uh, heteronormativity. Um, so I, I uh, had written this uh, positive review of it because I think it's a brilliant book. And this person emailed me this morning saying, why would American readers care about this? Um, you know, there's no American, you know, this is just his ethnic concern. And, <laughs> you know, he had this long paragraph and then he criticized, you know, the, the Indo-Guyanese presence, you know, in other places, it was it was just an odd email, but it definitely made me think about the word American and what on earth that person could have meant by American in that context, um, and why they thought they needed to educate me on what an American audience was. And I wasn't sure. I actually often, because I have Thelicelli as my last name now, um, I often it's often assumed I'm white, and actually Indian people assume it too. They assume that I haven't given a, a thorough critique because I'm not Hindu, or you know I'm not Indian because they just see that name Anita Felicelli, and it makes people think of, you know, some Italian movie star or something. So um, you know, I just I just you know got this email, and I you know it didn't bother me so much as the, just the fact that they were using that word. Why would American audiences care about this? And this is the feeling that goes back to what Miriam was saying. There's these silly ideas about like what an American audience is. I mean, there's so much, to, you know, heterogeneity, even in our own communities. And it was just, it was bizarre to think that we have to be feeding um, a stereotype of what an American audience is. And so, you know, I just wanted to go back to her comment about American dirt, because that's, that's what it is. It's just that there, there's this preconceived narrative of what, you know, an American audience wants and, you know, how it, how do we deal with that as critics? You know? I think that the question is really interesting and I don't know how to answer it, but I appreciate complicating the idea of an American book, an American critic, an American audience. And I'm reminded of the last book that I reviewed, which is um, Shiori Ito's Black Box, which is a Me Too memoir. And it was translated into English and published by Feminist Press. 
So it now has an American release. Does this make that translation an American text? Or is the fact that Me Too began as a movement in the United States founded by Tarana Burke that was then exported to Japan, does that American export of a social movement anchor it or make it an American book? Or is it that Ito uh, traveled to the United States and parts of the memoir take place in New York where she meets uh, the perpetrator who sexually assaults her? That happens in New York. Which of those factors make it American or don't make it American? So I, I love the question, but I don't know how to answer it. It's such a great point because what does it mean to say American when we live in a global world where so much of what this country's experience is about is immigration. And so many of the great books that we're seeing these days are about the immigrant experience. So, you know, is Behold the Dreamers and Bolo Mbue book an American, is that an American text? It's about Cameroonian immigrants. Um, and, and so it's almost like we have a permeable, we should have a permeable definition of what American is because so many people are defining themselves in different ways as American. And so many writers are identified with more than one country. So maybe a question that can come out of that is, how, you know, how do we, how do we begin to combine writing about immigrant experience and racial experience as reviewers? I feel like I have a lot to learn. I've got the whole world <laughs> that I have to learn about, not just this country. I don't know, I think it's very, for me, it's very simple. American text is written by anybody who lives in America. <laughs> That's it, you know, and, you know, I live in Minneapolis, which people often think is white. There's 150 first languages in the schools. My kids went to a school that was 20% Native American, 20% uh, Black American and East African, 20% Latinx, 10% Asian, and 30% white. What's typical in that school? That's more and more what America is going to be. So, it, you know, it, to me, it, 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 Anita, the, the person who wrote you, it's, it's just stupid. It's just, it it's just a stupid response. And, and as I, I, I often tell my students, don't write for the most stupid racist reader. You know, it's like you write for readers, you know, who will understand what you're writing. Yeah, and I feel, I feel a little spoiled by being at Los Angeles Review of Books because, you know, as a whole, we don't really get letters like that. And, and most of the readers are familiar with, you know, with the idea of white privilege and are re and when they come to me, when I'm being pitched by a, a, a white critic, um, they, I think that they know they're pitching a black woman. And so automatically there's all of this that gets filtered out, you know? And then my mother um, was Panamanian. And so my, and then I was born in Los Angeles. And so my view of the world is that, you know, I mean, my mother's an immigrant. So I kind of see everybody as an immigrant and I see the city as everybody comes from the city. So it, 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 it sparked becoming a world traveler. And so I have this global view of the world and it's sort of it's sort of a global bubble like so th there is this kind of I'm almost spoiled with this idea that people are hip to <laughs> to most things you know and so that I think you know so that letter that you got Anita I just would have never seen it and you know, <laughs> and just can't imagine. Yeah, I'll just say I've never gotten a letter like that when I've written for you. <laughs> it was interesting. <laughs> there are more questions coming. Lisa, I want to ask, I want to ask you a question directly, Lisa, if it's okay, if you decline to answer. When when you talk about Los Angeles Review of Books and um, having white critics pitch. Maybe they don't know that um, you're an African-American editor. I'm just really curious about what kinds of rich racial conversations you've had with 
um, writers. I mean, I, I wrote something where you were my editor and we had a, a little bit of a conversation about some things that I said. It was about Baldwin and Jesmyn Ward. You challenged me a little bit. Um, and I was like, oh, I need to think about that. I don't know if you remember the specifics. I don't need to say what they are. The specifics, but I know that, you know, that when it was I a creative was, challenge. Yes, yes. And, and I feel like um, um, I work intuitively, like I choose I, when, whenever I'm pitched, I do read, you know, some of the work of, you know, the, the writer who is pitching me, but I also really get a strong feeling yes or no right away. And so then whatever happens between us, like you're mentioning this, I don't even really remember any kind of tug, but it's, it's almost like it's a more of a personality thing, like either, you know, either the review is is near perfect or there's this issue to look at like let's look at it but when you brought me like the queer nigerian um literature piece i don't think there was anything much to edit at all i mu must have maybe cut a little bit it might have been long maybe but it was you know and so and that's what i mean like where i feel that i i do feel spoiled at lar because i do feel that who is coming to me is is sophisticated and and you know and and knowing and you know and has had experience i mean of course there are exceptions to that but then i just you know barely i just delete 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 you know so it's not. can i can i actually give the specific example because i think okay, it might, yeah it, i mean don't worry don't worry <laughs> um that the viewers might get a little bit of a window into, you know, how an editor and a writer work. It, it, it yeah. was not a big deal. So uh, I wrote about James Baldwin, Another Country, and Jasmine Ward's um, Single Married Sings. They both had Black-White interracial relationships in them. That's what I was writing about. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't actually have any back and forth about Jasmine Ward, but Baldwin we did. And one specific thing I remember was that I said something about, oh, he had to go to Paris to uh, flee racism in America, uh -huh. maybe that's what maybe that's what maybe that's what the the, the young character in Sing and Buried Sing will ultimately need to do. And what I remember you wrote was you referenced yourself, which I thought was really interesting. You said, "Well, you know, Paris, I had some uh, not so oh. good racial experience there." Oh yeah, I mean, and you said that as a way of really times. questioning the generalization. Which, yeah. And I changed it, or we changed it, whatever. Right, right, right. So yeah. I'm curious, like, was that an anomaly? Or do you have conversations? You know, and it's an like, interracial conversation. No, I, I am very, uh, very quick to bring in my own experience if something just feels prickly, like if it's yeah. like in my skin, like, and, you know, um, in having gone to, to France so much and to have and then have traveled all over the place and to have experienced the most racism there and you know how i mean i mean we know that they have problems with black people in specific black people and arab people it's like you know the french they have a problem and so i just wanted to point that out that like i, I didn't want the readers to feel like, oh yes, black people can still, you know, um, escape racism by going to Paris. So that must have just, yeah. So I'm never afraid to bring myself into the editing by saying this. Right. You know, I, I think, you know, as a reader of this review, I would just go, well, you know. So, so that's how I handled it. But I didn't remember because I think I probably yeah. do it a lot. Well, you're when... editing so many pieces, you know, and I write like one piece every four yeah. months. You know? But I want to, I'm curious for everybody getting inside the editing process a little bit, like what kind of conversations do you have or not have that maybe should be or could be had around the racial content of, of your review, either an editor who, there may be an editor who's not conscious, they're not dealing with race, or they're really conscious, um, the way that Lisa was with me, and you're having a great conversation. I don't feel like I have any sense of what's happening in those dialogues between writers and editors. Is there a question there? 
the, the question is, what kind of experiences have you had when writing reviews, or not even necessarily reviews, it could just be a piece of lit crit that's not strictly a review. You're getting edited. Do conversations in the editing process come up around the racial content, the commentary that you're making on the racial content? Yeah, I'll just say I haven't had had a conversation like that personally. Um, I have definitely had conversations, you know, related to some finer point in the in the review, and I've definitely create, you know, written reviews of um, authors' books where the author was not of the same racial or cultural background as me. But I haven't received much pushback. On the other hand, most of the editors have been white, so I think you know there's that layer of like I, I don't there's automatically gonna be an assumption that I'm correct because about an Indian author. And then, you know, there's maybe not very much looking at whether, you know, I have a different racial background than the other, than the other uh, authors whose books I review, you know? So I, I don't, I, it has actually never come up for me, um, but I'm maybe an anomalous instance because the, the Indian identity is fairly invisible anyway. So, you know, um, that may be why. I'm not, I'm not getting challenged particularly on that. I've had an Asian American editor tell me that I, I had a piece on Asian American uh, issues of gender. And he said he had to convince the, the other white editors that there was some value in the subject. That they were sort of like, not quite overtly, but like really who cares about this? Like, what does this really have to do with anything that's important? Um, yeah, so the, 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 again, that goes back to what, what people inherently find interesting. What, 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 what do they find is complex? And, I, you know, and as a writer, I just accept that. I, I just know that I'm going out into the world where my interests are going to be marginalized. That's just the way it is, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. I, I go out expecting that as well. I just wanted to jump in too. I think Alana had a good question here. Um, I don't know how many editors are part of the National Book Critics Circle, but I wonder how we might discuss or challenge the way editors hire critics, both how they pigeonhole writers like Miriam mentioned and how they judge who maybe shouldn't review certain books. Um, so my question is, how would you like editors to approach this? What are best practices? So I would turn that over to you three, maybe um, if you have any thoughts about it, um, David, Lisa, and Miriam. Or is that too like a, a long question? I break it down into a smaller, <laughs> smaller part. I mean, instead of assuming that a racialized person is going to only be the best critic for books that are similarly racialized. I imagine editors asking critics what types of books they would like to review would be like a simple starting point. I mean, Nobody ever asks me to review books on botany and I'm very interested in botany, you know what I mean? I'm interested yeah. in I'm interested in so many things, but right. people um, tend to call me when they need a Mexican. And like, I appreciate that um, and I'm happy to weigh in, but I'd also like to weigh in on lots and lots of subjects. And I had, um, I had an experience a few months ago where I was invited to be in conversation with a writer who um, published a book on uh, undocumented Americans. And uh, because the experience was supposed to be writers in conversation, and I consider this writer my friend, I thought, okay, this audience is going to get a treat because they're going to watch us be an intimate conversation with one another. And I noticed in the chat function and in the Q&A that there were audience members in what I would characterize in, in aggressive tones, ordering me 
as the interlocutor to not discuss frivolous topics like mental health and beauty and to get back on subject and discuss immigration. And the more those questions rolled in, the more frivolous <laughs> my conversation became as a political act. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I was like, okay, if, 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 if you want me, if you want the two of us to perform immigration trauma here, what you're gonna get is lip gloss and glitter so that you understand that we're human beings who enjoy lip gloss and glitter. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and so, and so that, that demand, uh, that, that demand for racialized performance is just, it's so disgusting. It, it's, it's really disgusting. And, and one really simple way to evade it is to ask critics what they would like to write about or talk about. Uh, there's a thread here that popped up that I want to address, which is about the little Italian Americans. First of all, Jess Rowe has written, I think, very cogently about the little and being an Italian American. Um, Baldwin has this passage in the beginning of his collected uh, works where he talks about the ways that that Italian Americans, Irish Americans, they got here, they became white. It was a process, but they were white. I was just watching The Godfather last night, and there's a scene which is right on Pearl Harbor. It's in the day after Pearl Harbor. And nobody in the family is worried about what's going to happen to them as Italian Americans, which is entirely different from what the Japanese American community felt December 8, 1942. Beyond that, what I recognize as an Asian American is I will never be part of America in a certain way. That my Americanness is always contingent on America's relationship with Asia, as we've seen in the past year and a half. And that, that when, if anything goes wrong with America's relationship with Asia, I will suddenly become not an American. So even though my family's been here for more than a century, my status as an American is contingent. It is not permanent and it can be erased at any second. And that's yeah. different than for Italian Americans. I'm just gonna say, I agree with that. And, and, and frequently because people don't realize my actual race, uh, because I have this disguise, they have said things to me that they would not say if they knew what my race was. And I think that there's that same kind of um, approach to reviews where there's just assumptions made about about books and in the Italian American experience you know yeah there 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 was racism but it has it, they have adopted privileges of whiteness and so they're in a very different position than those of us who are either through our names or visibly you know our appearances or you know uh, our accents whatever that we're in a I think I feel we're in a different like more vulnerable position. So um, but yeah, I, I would, that's what I would comment to that as well. Um. If I go deep into an Italian American experience, which is way outside my own, I'm a Jewish guy, although we're both Mediterranean, perhaps we share something there. But I mean, I have to do perhaps as much work um, as I would in looking into another culture that is racially uh, not white. So the fact that Italian Americans are classified as white because they do uh, realistically in, in the 21st century uh, experience whiteness because they experience white privilege, they have white privilege. That doesn't mean that it's going to be any easier for me to take on a book that has a complex exploration of Italian and Italian American culture. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's true. They became white in order to become invisible. People have made that comment about Indians too, that they are uh, becoming white in order to become invisible. Um, but I think there is like a, mar a marked difference. When I go out in the world, I actually am mistaken for numerous other backgrounds. I have people talking to me in other languages or asking me like, oh, you know, it, it, it's a, just a very different physical experience in the world. That's not to belittle 
you know, the Italian experience or the Italian immigrant experience when Italian Americans um, immigrated. And, you know, my spouse feels that way strongly as well. So I can respect <laughs> your view, Fred. But, um, but it, but I, my experience out in the world is different. And I see, I see it when I'm with my spouse who is Italian, that he is not treated the way that I am treated. And whether that's because of gender or because of race, it's a different experience. And it's a clearly different experience. And it's expect an expectation of the world that you will be taken seriously. My expectation of the world is that I will, I, you know, I'm an attorney licensed for 20 years and I have people questioning me about the law. I was an English major. I was a rhetoric major. I was an art major. And I have people questioning my competence at every turn. Um, and this is like 20 years of experience. I know that I don't look that way, but, um, but that questioning of competence is not something my spouse experiences to the same degree. And he is Italian and his, his grandparents did have difficulties and I don't belittle that in any way, but right now in this moment, my experience is different. I, I mean, the last four years I spent, you know, worrying that we were going to end up in that the people of color were going to be end up, end up in concentration camps. That was a very different fear. And I, I felt it very strongly and my spouse didn't think there was anything to worry about. So you know, it's a different uh, physical experience at this moment in time. And especially if you've been subject to violence. I mean, I think that's the other thing. It's like you read these reviews and you look at, you know, how, um, how white critics are looking at uh, violent racism. <laughs> and it's just, if you know, oh, it's overblown or that would never happen. That's not plausible. But you know, those of us who have had family members who faced violence due to their skin color or um, gender identity feel feel very differently about this. You know, I don't I don't read that you know those books and go, oh, this is implausible. You know, so I have a question here. I mean, from the audience, not me. Um, it's about language. That's why I picked it out. You know, on a small level. The question is: Is there any trend or momentum for critics to identify racist or colonial phrases that are common in American dialogue? For example, it's a jungle out there. I mean, so I guess, yeah. when I'm, so I, I do edit. Um, I'm, I'm the editor in chief of a magazine of commentary and criticism. And when I do edit, I am on the lookout for those archaic uh, mm -hmm. racist and colonial phrases. And I will just, do my light line edits and cut them right out without necessarily even <laughs> telling you know the writer. Um, but something that that I find I uh, that, that I find I uh, useful and that I advocate for is I'm um, not italicizing words that are not in English, like. That, that's something that, that I've had to advocate for a lot in my writing because I will write in Spanglish on occasion. And to me, Spanglish is its own dialect. And so to me, it's visually othering to italicize the Spanish words. And it's an attempt to kind of parse, um, parse out two realities that to me don't exist separately. Wow. Um, and so that to me uh, is, is an interesting intervention, and it's something that I would like to see adopted uh, more in prose. We're going to have to close out in a minute. But does anyone anyone want to add some last thoughts before we before we finish up? I just want to say that wow, we just have like so many threads here that we've that we've woven. I don't feel like we've woven them together. I just feel like we have a lot of threads. Um, and I just hope that uh, everybody who's viewing and, and we ourselves just take these and take them out into further conversations, ongoing conversations, it's really rich. I agree. And I'm just so happy to be here with the four of you and see you face to face, you know, after working with, you know, three of you. <laughs> and no, you know, like just being friends from through words, you know, but now, now we're, we have the faces now. So <laughs> yeah, this is great. I'd love for this to be an ongoing conversation or this yeah. 
series because this to me, I mean, it seems like all we did was just dip our toes in the pool. Like I want to go swimming. So <laughs> well, you guys can all come to my house in the mission if you want. <laughs> that sounds great. Right. We can yeah, do it in person. Sounds now. really fantastic. I do want to continue um, the conversation. It's my hope that we can actually make this an ongoing series because one conversation you really can only get, you know, yeah, you can only dip your toes in and and not even maybe your toenails in. Right. Um, so I okay, wanted to just, I just say, make, I just want to make, oh, go ahead, David. One point. You know, I want to refer back to Morrison's point in playing in the dark, where she says, up until recently, and I think this practice still goes on, when white writers write, they don't think about a reader of color. They don't think about a black reader. And I, I think one of the things that's useful, say, about teaching at Vona is, is that all the people in class realize, like, I, in, in this class, I have Latinx writers, I have black writers, I have Asian writers, I have Arab writers, I have native writers, and they're all reading my work and they're giving me critiques. And this is who I'm writing. I have to consider it. It doesn't, you know, Toni Morrison wrote for a black audience. She didn't write for a white audience, but she was obviously aware that white critics would be criticizing her work that she had to get through white gatekeepers white writers have to start writing and realizing that you're writing to America and you have to think about the different readerships and the ways, and that can help you to critique your own work. If you go like, what is, what, you know, what are black readers gonna think? What are Asian American readers gonna think? What are Latinx mm -hmm. readers, you know? And to mm -hmm. add to that, like, uh, I, I, I wanted to say one more thing, like, when the American dirt moment happened, one uh, quote that kept being hurled back at me for having critiqued that book so harshly is a Morrison quote. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing. She urged people to write outside of their experience, but she did not say that we're obligated to applaud botched attempts at writing <laughs> outside of one's experience. So yes, I encourage everybody to write outside of that experience. But it, critics are going to respond and we're going to respond freely. So I wanted right. to add that because I've just been sitting on that. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Okay. I'm going to actually just sort of say, you know, I would love for the people who are emerging critics to be able to stay for just like five or 10 minutes, if it's okay with the panelists. And if you don't, can't stay, obviously not. I just see that they're in the chat, that there's some emerging critics and we had promised that they get a kind of a more direct um, experience. And I have to figure out the, you know, our webinar function to do that. But I just want to thank everybody um, for coming and, you know, for all these great questions and just sort of engaging with this idea. I'm really, I'm really hopeful after hearing, you know, such a spirited conversation. And especially, I really feel like we could keep going. Um, I, I mean, I loved, I love these closing remarks, but I feel like they're actually springboards for even further conversation, which is like, I hope we can continue that conversation. Um, so I'm going to just say that um, emerging critics, please, please stay um, for a, just a few minutes if you would like to. And if you wouldn't, that's also fine. So. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. This is great. Thank you. Yeah. So are we going to be able to see the other people yeah. or are they going to write questions? My hope is that we can actually convert this to a Zoom chat, but I am trying to figure out how we do that because this is my first time. Um, no, I, can, right. I, mean, I can help with that. that. I yeah. think so. Um, okay. And if you don't, maybe we can do it in the chat, but I would love to be able for everybody to just have a conversation as if we were more at like a, you know, at a party or something, having a conversation where you get insights without necessarily. Um... Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop recording. Um...